a big welcome to all of you joining from all over the place, it seems. I'm so delighted to have you all in the Zoom room with us today. My name is Lindsay Taylor, and I am the current president of New Mexico Folk Music and Dance Society, and I'm delighted to be here once again with David Millstone, and where we are talking about Contra Chestnuts, or he will be talking about it, and then we'll have an opportunity for discussion at the end as well. Um, so some housekeeping notes. Uh, if you have any questions throughout the in, uh, entire presentation, feel free to use the chat function. And if this is your very first time on Zoom, the way you get to chat is by moving your mouse on the screen. And then at the very bottom of the screen, there will be a button that says chat. If you don't see a button that says chat, click the button that says more and then click chat. Um, and that will bring a chat screen to the right hand screen of your device. Uh, so I am going to go ahead and give our host for today uh, the spotlight uh, video. So David, thank you so much for being here. We're so delighted. Um, and yeah, I'll let you take it from here. Oh, um, just so everybody knows, this is being recorded and it will be up on our YouTube uh, channel as soon as I am able to edit the video and upload that. It might take a day or two. So if you have to step away uh, for any reason, you can always um, take a look at this video or reference it again uh, later on. And after uh, that is uploaded, I will upload I will send out an email to all participants uh, with that link. So thank you for being here. Okay, well, thank you all. One of the things, um, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. I had a wonderful time last time um, and I'm looking forward to sharing my love of some of these older dances with, with you. Um, last time I had Lindsay busily entering information throughout the chat. Um, I'm, I'm in uh, screen sharing mode and I can't actually see the chat window. So comments you put in it right now, I won't see, but she'll be able to monitor them. And she's also going to upload in the chat window a PDF of um, links to, uh, to the videos that I'll be showing, to other resources, um, when I make reference to various things and, and you, you want to know more about it chances are it'll be in that PDF. And she'll put it in um, shortly if she hasn't already and um, partly through the me meeting and, and uh, again at the meeting toward, toward the end, I think. So um, I wanna get this out of the way. Can I do that? Uh, there we go. Um, so here we are. Um, and I'd like to thank Folk Mads for um, sponsoring this and also to New Mexico Arts, the state arts agency for funding this event and other events throughout this challenging year. Our state arts councils have really stepped up. Um, so what I'd like you to do right now um, is take a moment and enter into the chat window the names of some dances that in your mind fall into the chestnuts category, those of you who are contra dancers. If that means nothing to you, then skip it. But those of you who, who are dancers, take a moment and type in some of the names of the dances that, that you think of as the chestnuts. And some of them will probably appear in this presentation and others um, we'll talk about later on. So the obvious first question is why, why are they called chestnuts? Um, and the answer to that basically lies with one, one person, um, Joan Pelton, who was involved in the folk scene in upstate New York starting in the late 1960s. She was part of the picking and singing gathering at the Cafe Lina in Saratoga, which is America's oldest continuously running coffee house. She was involved in the Fox Hollow Folk Festival that started in the 1960s, run by the, the Beers family. And she was the piano player on the very first Hammered Dulcimer album by Phoenix All Stars. This is the album that ended up selling about 100,000 copies, uh, in part because 
Gaspé Reel was picked up as the theme song for Crockett's Victory Garden on PBS. Joan moved to Vermont. She worked at Philo Records, PH Philo, which was an independent record label. And then she became an independent distributor and a salesperson for folk music records um, in, in, in the Northeast, turning up at festivals all, all over the place. In 1977, Joan Pelton started Alcazar Records. And this was a record company with a mission. And I'm going to read their mission statement in little chunks here. Alcazar as a corporation is dedicated to the working musicians and callers of the world. The intent of the corporation is to research, record, and publish traditional dance music and make it available to interested individuals everywhere. Uh, Sandy Bradley. We believe that good dance music of all types can also be good listening music and that making good dance records available will foster the tradition of using live music before dancing. In 1980, Joan was in touch with Rodney and Randy Miller. And uh, in a letter to Rodney, she wrote, I've spoken with Randy at length about a proposed record of New England chestnuts, meaning the dances that are still danced in New England that have become traditional, whatever traditional means. So it's Joan Pelton who's responsible for that particular moniker being applied. I wrote a lengthy article um, about the backstory of chestnuts, and you'll find a reference to that and a link in, in the packet. If you're interested in this topic, I strongly urge you to buy the book. David Smuckler wrote a wonderful series of columns over three years for CDSS. I contributed a few, and we put them together in this book, which is available through CDSS. And on the CDSS website, there's an extraordinary collection of resources all about the chestnuts. Now, keep in mind that we're talking about a very small number of dances here. When Ricky Holden, uh, writing in 1954, put together the Contra Dance book, um, he talks about all the Contras, meaning 91, that have appeared in readily available American literature up until that time. So 91 Contras. When I checked just a couple days ago, 14,195 published contra dances. So there has been an extraordinary explosion in the repertoire. We're going to be focusing on some of those older ones today. So let's start by looking at some contra truisms that I, I like to think of. So the things that everyone knows, everyone knows. These are the established classics of the repertoire, beloved by generations of dancers. Every dance has a specific tune associated with it. And there's an agreed upon choreography for the steps of each dance. Well, maybe yes, maybe no. Let's just dig a little deeper into that. So let's take the first one, the established classics of the contra repertoire. Well, let's look back a little bit. Elizabeth Birchenall was one of the first people to do actual research and publish dances and music based on actual field research, mostly in northern New England. And her book, American Country Dances, which came out, um, she, she mentioned some of the most widely used dances, The Circle. I had never heard of The Circle. Here's a little of the tune. And I love this. While among the half forgotten or less used ones are chorus jig. Now, when I started going to camp, dance camps in the Oh, in the 1980s, 
late at night after the callers had gone to sleep and there were musicians and people just wanting to dance. The one dance you could always count on everyone knowing and even knowing how to call if you needed a caller, but everyone knew it, was chorus jig. So clearly between Elizabeth Birchenall's time and, and the current time, or when I was starting out with this, um, things, things had changed. So that's Birchenall. Ralph Page, the great New England caller and dance historian, he called his first public dance in 1930, and the Country Dance Book first came out in 1937. Ralph edited a one-man labor of love, a magazine called Northern Junket, um, which oh, went on for 165 issues starting in the late 40s. The index to Northern Junket includes some 350 articles in the dance history section. And writing in 1973, here's what Ralph Page had to say. These are the dances that were common 50 years ago, meaning in the 20s, seldom danced at the present time. And two of the dances there that I've highlighted are ones that we're going to be talking about. So the question is, where did our collection of chestnuts, the ones that David wrote about, that I wrote about, and that many of us who started dancing in the 70s or 80s think of as the chestnuts. And um, we'll take you on a little geographic tour to get to the likely spot, the home of the chestnuts. Well, here's the big picture. Zooming into the northeast of the United States, zooming in a little closer, ah, there's New Hampshire and there's southwestern New Hampshire. And finally, five towns that Ralph Page cited as really important uh, communities. These five towns, Nelson, Stoddard, Antrim, Hancock, and Harrisville, 10 miles from Nelson to Antrim. We're talking about a very small portion of the world. And it's basically from this region that the, the chestnuts that, we, um, that I'll be talking about are, are associated with, with this region. So Nelson, in particular, is the one with the, the biggest name recognition, and people have made pilgrimages to dance in Nelson. These are photos of Ralph Page calling in Nelson in the 1940s. Everyone's dressed up. You see men in coats and ties, um, and uh, no, no, uh, short, no running shorts and sweatbands and T-shirts here. Um, Nelson dance was started um, a regular dance was started in the 30s to cater mostly to tourists, to city folk who were coming, um, particularly the skiers. And then it um, was restarted in the 40s. Um, and the Nelson dance has been going on now for, for quite a while in the last uh, 30, 40 years. So the Ralph Page called in Nelson, many other people did, and when Dudley Loffman started calling there in the 1950s, the committee made their expectations really clear to him. They, they knew Dudley, he had been there a little bit. Um, they set out the time limits that they wanted it to be, how long the intermission should be, when it should be, and then the key phrase, traditional Nelson dance program, so that all the old and loved dance, old contras are done each dance. And they proceed to spell them out, the ones that they wanted on every single, every single program. So we'll be looking at some of those dances. And in the course of this, I hope you come to appreciate how these dances link us to our history, not, <coughs> excuse me, not just the history of dancing, but the history of our country, and also our connection with people over the generations, over the centuries, and also with people from different cultures. Ralph Page had a regular column in Northern Junket where he shared his research about dance history, and he called it, It's Fun to Hunt. And it's really been fun for me. I know it was fun for David Smuckler and others who have dug into the dances. And I'll share some of what we found. And I hope that as you go looking into this, you too have fun and share your what you find. So we're going to start with Lady Walpole's Reel. And there is, in fact, a complicated story associated with it. 
but I've dinged it for now because I'm afraid that I'm going to run too late. So at the end, if anyone's interested, when we've had our chat, remind me, I'll start up presentation mode again, and uh, I can talk about uh, Lady Walpole's, the, the story associated with it. One of the first contras was Lady Walpole's with the ones crossed over, a, a duple improper dance. And I'm going to play this video and I'd like you to observe the interaction between the active couple whom you don't quite see. Uh, well, you see the gent at the top at the lower left corner and, and the partner between the, these two people. OK, here we go. So in short, there's not much interaction between them. And the dance was colloquially known in the Monadnock region of New Hampshire back in the day as the married man's favorite uh, because he didn't see his wife very much. Now, the dance could just as easily have been called the married woman's favorite um, if she had the same feelings. And that goes back to that uh, story about Lady Walpole, which will get to uh, perhaps a little bit later. Um, it was a staple of the traditional uh, New Hampshire repertoire. This is Ralph Page uh, talking about it. Um, his comment, in many places it was known as Lady Washington's Reel, which implies that the dance is an older one. Um, he uh, describes Lady Walpole's in beautiful detail in a lengthy piece that he wrote in the first four issues of Northern Junket in which he describes a kitchen junket. And in the PDF that Lindsay has put in the chat window, I've given you the links to that. It's an evocative portrait of a kitchen junket from Ralph's youth. It's slightly fictionalized, but only slightly. And for any of you interested in dance history, I, I, I commend that to you. It's, you'd be reading it online, and it's well worth the time. So uh, let's take a look at um, these chestnut truisms here. We've looked at the established classics. Well, that changes over time. Every dance has a specific tune associated with it. And Lady Walpole's gives us a good example of that. Um, and I want to take a slight side trip to talk a little bit about Newt Tolman, who was a key figure in the, uh, the dance revival scene. Newt dreamed of being a classical flutist, but he was forced to leave school at age 17. And um, living in Nelson, uh, his, his first wife was the one who started the Nelson dances in the 30s, and his second wife is the one who started the dances in the 40s. And Newt would play for the dances. He was an amazing flute player, but he did not like the common repertoire, tunes like Arkansas Traveler or Turkey in the Straw. And he writes, I could usually get through the evening only by making frequent trips to the woodshed where we kept a bottle of some appropriate anesthetic handy. Newt Tolman is the person who suggested to Dudley Lofman the, the name of the Canterbury Orchestra. Um, and uh, when Dudley uh, questioned that, saying that he was the only one who lived in Canterbury, Newt's response was, how many members of the Budapest String Quartet live in Budapest? Um, and he had very strong opinions about tunes, and he loved the tune for Lady Walpole's. He wrote, to choose a melody for comparison purposes against which reels and hornpipes may be judged, Lady Walpole reel will do well enough. It hasn't a repeated measure or even a repeated phrase through both strains, the last measure of the first and second strain contrasting with the first builds up to a fine climax. So here's Newt on flute and his partner Kay Gilbert on piano, his musical partner, playing the tune. Thank you. 
and the album is available and the, the Nelson collection, the classic collection of books is available. That's also in your, in your handout. Um, someone wrote Ralph Page once and said, well, when you call, you don't just um, you, you call all the way through. And Ralph's feeling was, well, I'm paid to be the caller, so I'm going to call all the way through. And he wrote out what his calls might be for Lady Walpole's Reel, um, a whole series of couplets so that he could call all the way through. And we have a recording with him, with him calling. Um, so um, we've talked a lot about this tune, uh, Lady Walpole's Reel, formerly known as Masai's Favorite. There's a problem though. That tune is in the key of B flat. And many country fiddlers at the time could not play easily in the key of B flat. Uh, so called D fiddlers, because D is an easy key to play in on the fiddle. Um, so Ralph often used Fireman's Reel in the key of D for Lady Walpole's Reel. When he recorded it, he put it, the tune The Reel of Stumpy. And so here's a taste of Ralph calling that with some of those um, rhyming couplets. Now balance and swing below. Now swing her high and swing her low. Now down the center with your roll. And the same way back when you get below. You cast off the one you swung and the same two lady chain. Now chain the ladies over. And chain him back again. I've been thinking a lot about these old dances, and and I've been framing it in terms of they provide the contra dance DNA, sort of the basic building blocks that other dances um, use. So Lady Walpole's gives us all these these figures, um, which are key to the repertoire. So we're going to turn our attention. To, a, to another dance, Petronella. And I've called this one Hot Modern Moves. And that's, <laughs> that's because I was calling some years ago in a large city that shall go unnamed. And at the end of the dance, a dancer came up, a sort of middling young dancer, and complimented me on the program, said he had had a wonderful time, blah, blah, blah. And then at the end, he said, and you didn't call many dances with Hot Modern Moves. And I was a bit taken aback. I hadn't called any traditional dances at all that evening. Everything came from the last 20 or 30 years. And um, much of it had been written within the last 10 years. So I was a little puzzled. I said, well, hot modern moves, what do you have in mind? And he said, well, you know, like Petronella twirls. No idea that there had been a dance named Petronella. Um, no idea about any of that. And I just sort of smiled and um, uh, thanked him for thanked him for his compliments. So, Petronella, of course, comes from the from the Scots, and um, we'll take a look at some lovely Scottish country dancers doing this dance. The dancers will now dance dance one from book one, Petronella. <laughs> I've stopped it there because the Scots do it with their very common ending, which is a Scottish poussette, um, where the American contro is a little bit different. Well, the Scots have their prescribed footwork um, and the pas de bas step there. When the dance comes to America and changed, it became in time all about the balance. Dancers were known for their fancy footwork. And here's. It was it was the sh the showpiece, and for those of you watching who were thinking, well, what was there to do? What was there in the way of balancing? Um, fortunately, 
Dr. Ralph Piper in an issue of Northern Junket um, went through 50 variations. Now, I'm not going to give you time to read them all, but you can sort of read a couple and get a, get a sense of the, the different possibilities here. It was, I'm told, considered rude to use someone else's sort of trademark balance, especially if they were in the hall. Um, but dancers would develop their own particular way of balancing um, and, um, and show off because it was just the ones who were balancing the, the act of couples while people got a chance to, to, to watch them. Typically, you do one kind of balance step each time through the dance and then the next time through the dance you might do a different one if you were if you were showing off i love this comment here the what's not correct is for one person to do one style while his partner does another oh no 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 people will have to dance to, i love this each doing a solo dance instead of dancing with each other so we're going to take a look at a clip of uh, Dudley Lofman at, at Newport. When Dudley took uh, the New England country dancers to the Newport Folk Festival, he did not take with him a polished performance team. Many of the people were in fact experienced dancers, but he made a point of bringing some others who were more casual dancers because he wanted it to look on stage the way it looked at a regular dance in, in Nelson or, or wherever. Um, wanted it to be the way it was at home. And I've edited this. You can see the whole clip in the Dudley Lofman video I made. But you're going to see Dudley and his wife Cynthia, his wife at the time, joining in at the top. And you can see Dudley really strutting his stuff uh, with a wide variety of different moves. He's in the, the white pants and the white jacket. and down the center and back and cast off. Well, Petronella um, still turns up uh, at a lot of dances in New England. Here's one from um, um, uh, bah, 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 from the fall ball and uh, just, just a taste. Yes, Lisa Greenleaf having fun on the dance floor. Um, when I was talking about standard tunes, um, you know, now we think of Petronella as the tune or perhaps Green Mountain Petronella. But Ralph Page says that fiddlers often would play for that dance, The Girl I Left Behind Me and Finnegan's Wake. So we need to look at a couple important changes that happened in the dance. Um, and one of the changes is from two dancers balancing to four. And on this call, I saw that we have Donnie Parkhurst. Um, and Donnie, you can chime in if I've got the story wrong, but this is from Dudley. Dudley, Dudley told me, when the Back to the Landers started coming to the dances in the early 70s, they started taking two hands on Petronella and turning under each other. Or one would turn under and the other just move to the four corners, 
balancing at each one. Then came the inactives joining in. I remember the night clearly. Glenn Toll was dancing with Tara Garland and Donnie Parkhurst with Inga Thompson. The week before, they had learned Roxburgh Castle, an English dance that has everyone turning around to the right at once. Glenn and Donnie decided to introduce that figure into Petronella, and Citronella was born. And Dudley told me uh, on another time, a week or two before he died, I was having coffee with Ted Sinella in Wiscasset, Maine. Ted asked me what I thought of the current version of Petronella. I said I didn't like it with the inactives joining in on the turns and balances. He said, why, you started it. I said, beg your pardon, but Donnie Parkhurst and Glenn Toll got that thing going. You didn't tell kids that age how to dance. I thereafter called it Citronella. We agreed that we didn't like it. And if Ted Sinella were on the floor and Petronella was called um, and people started doing the four-person spinning, um, he, he would not join in. That was not the dance that, that he thought um, that it should be. So that was obviously one big change, going from two dancers to four doing the balancing. And then there's the dreaded Petronella clap, that social disease that has spread. And when David Smuckler was working on um, his essay about Petronella for the Cracking Chestnuts column, he heard from Steve Gold, a Detroit area dancer, who believes that he may have been the originator of the Petronella clap. David wrote, after a ham bone workshop with Steve Hickman, he figured out how to recreate the tune of Petronella in its entirety using only his hands. He began doing this at dances in Detroit in the 1980s where Petronella was a favorite dance whenever he danced it as a second gent because he wouldn't have much to do. Most of the other dancers could not keep up with him, but many were inspired to join in for the last two or three. The clap clap escaped Michigan by the early 1990s. So those two major changes. Um, then there's the Petronella twirls. Of course, originally there was Petronella, or Patinella, as it was known in New Hampshire. Dudley's daughter Heidi wrote a dance in 1974 which, in which she threw in all her favorite figures called Simple Gifts, and it included Petronella twirls. The dance didn't get much currency, didn't get out into the dance world. And then in 1983, Ted Sinella wrote Fiddleheads. Of all the dances that Ted wrote, he said that this was the one he was most proud of. And here's the dance being called with Tony Parks as the caller. Once cross, loop left, make your diamond balance. Right, balance, right. One swing, and down you go. A wonderful, wonderful piece of choreography. So that was really, aside from Petronella and the one little footnote that I threw in there, Ted's dance, Piddleheads, was really the first time that the twirls made it into another dance. When David Smuckler started writing his column about this dance in 2005, there were 60 dances with Petronella twirls in them. And when I checked a couple days ago, there were 1,105 contra dances with Petronella twirls. So uh, we all borrow from each other. And um, early at the start of the Petronella session, I played a sample of how the, the RSCDS wants dancers to balance and how it should look. Well, some Scottish dancers here recorded in New Zealand seem to like the uh, <coughs> Citronella style. Uh, 
I love that those two knew that they had to get out of the way, um, and they did. And if you didn't notice, in the background, there are two gents dancing together, and they were doing it just the, the official royal Scottish country dance style. So looking at our contra dance DNA here, um, Petronella gives us a proper dance. It's our first one tonight. And of course, the Petronella spin. So a short section coming up on this dance. So Lamplighters is our original dance, long wavy lines with um, balances or turns in them. And um, taking a look at our truisms here, the agreed upon choreography for the steps of each dance. Well, <clears throat> that changes over time and changes from community to community. I'm gonna play um, an edited section of video um, from the Ralph Page weekend where Fred Brunig was calling and he presented five different versions of Lamplighter's Hornpipe. And the very first one that you'll see shows the full dance, including down the center and back, cast off, right and left. But um, the subsequent four, I've edited that out and you'll see an ever increasing level of activity for the dancers. Uh, I will point out in the very first clip as we start out, there's a large chent in a blue t-shirt and that's uh, Donnie Parkhurst, one of the people who brought us Citronella. Um, it's also worth mentioning that if Lamplighters was the original long wavy lines, when I checked the other day, there were now 1,001 dances with balances and long wavy lines. Five versions of Lamplighters Hornpipe. So the dance changes, um, the choreography, the basic idea is the same, but there's lots of lots of variation. And Lamplighters adds quite a bit to my uh, growing list here of contra dance DNA basic figures. And our next one, we've moved from long waves and Hull's victory is the quintessential short waves. Now. American Contras don't exist in a vacuum. We've already seen close links with the Scots um, and there's um, other forms of country dance. I'm about to play three different versions that are very similar, um, except for the very last figure. And excuse me, I have been looking, trying to figure out which one comes first and so far I'm not successful. Um, so we're going to start by looking at a dance called Scottish Reform and you'll uh, note the opening figures of this dance. The It's a traditional dance apparently which celebrates the movement for political and economic reform in Scotland at the end of the 18th century at the same time in France and the US things happen but in the Scots uh, situation it didn't change much and the Scots will end the dance with that 
Pousset figure in, in B2. All right, so that's the Scots version. There's an old English dance, sometimes called Prince of Wales, but better known as Pins and Needles. The group that you're about to see, London Folk, was a demo group that um, performed regularly. And this was a reunion for them. And they're doing a routine that they had last danced 25 years earlier. Um, in the English version, the B2, the last part of the dance, is a dance around rather than that Scottish poussette. Halls has had numerous variations, and I'm going to play you a video now of one older style, and then we'll get to a newer one. And I've chosen this format because when you go to the CDSS Cracking Chestnuts website, you'll be able to see videos for every dance in the book, including numerous variations. So there'll be the information about who was calling, who the musicians are, where it was, and this wonderfully um, clever animated feature that was created by David Smuckler's son, Micah, which allows you to watch the video and watch the instructions at the same time as they change. So this is an older style of Hull's Victory, one that Ralph Page himself was quite fond of. And the way that we usually do it, certainly the way that I call it, uh, looks looks like this. And many of us, when we do those balances, like to balance forward and back rather than to the right and the left um, for reasons that might become obvious in this next little section. Who was Hull and what was his victory? Um, so this takes us back to the War of 1812. The American Navy at that time was pretty pathetic and the British Navy was incredibly powerful. Um, so we'll start by looking at the USS Constitution, one of the six frigates authorized by the Naval Act of 1794. And I think it's the oldest commissioned ship in any Navy in the world. Um, it was launched in 1797. Um, it was 200 feet long, had live oak timbers. The planking was seven inches thick 
Paul Revere made the copper fittings and the sheathing uh, that protected the hull. It included specialty wood from Maine to Georgia. The cannon were cast in Rhode Island. It really was a ship of the nation. And this portrait um, done by Gilbert Stewart, best known perhaps for his portrait of Washington, um, was a, a, rising, a rising captain in the American Navy. Before the war broke out, um, Hull and a British captain, uh, James Dacres, uh, met on shore, probably in a tavern in Delaware, and discussed the merits of their uh, respective navies. And Dacres proposed a wager that um, about who, who, would, who would win if the two ships went up against each other. And Hull said, I'll bet no money, but I'll wager a hat that my ship emerges victorious. Well, as it happened a short time later, maybe a month or so later, war was declared and the Constitution was sailing from Annapolis, Maryland and off the coast of New Jersey, she encountered five British ships. The wind died almost immediately and the hull ordered the crew to lower the boats and row and they started pulling the Constitution to try to get away. The British, however, gained on them because they had five ships and they could pull the crew together and get more boats to pull a, a British chase ship. Lieutenant Morris, who was Hull's second in command, had an idea and suggested, and Hull agreed, they spliced all the ropes on the Constitution together to make two huge cables. And they rowed ahead with one of them and dropped a small anchor, a kedge, about a mile ahead. And then while the sailors on board were pulling aft, that would move the Constitution forward against the fixed anchor. Meanwhile, other boats were pulling out um, the other rope uh, a mile ahead. And this gave the Constitution what passed for a burst of speed. Well, the British figured out what was going on and copied this maneuver. And this went on for 48 hours, the, the, the British chasing the Constitution through the night and through the day. Um, every so often, there'd be short gusts of wind and um, the ships could raise sails and then the wind would die and lower them. And finally, after nearly two days, storm clouds appeared and the Constitution's crew with what one history describes as with great ostentation prepared to batten everything down to prepare for a major gale. And the British figuring, well, the Americans must know their weather and their water. So they proceeded to do the same thing. The storm clouds rolled in, the rain came pouring down, visibility dropped to nothing. The Constitution immediately raised its sails and fled and escaped the British. They got to Boston, <coughs> um, refitted, and then Hull left Boston Harbor, not wanting to get blockaded there. Meanwhile, Dacres had moved farther north and had sent word to, um, to Boston area taverns, inviting American captains to uh, join him at sea for the purpose of having a few minutes tete a tete. Well, sure enough, uh, Constitution left Boston Harbor and shortly thereafter encountered the Guerriere and the two ships started drawing close to each other. Guerriere's first shells um, fell short or went through the rigging and Constitution had not fired at all. The ships are getting closer and closer together. Guerriere starts getting the range, cannonballs bounce off the, the Constitution, at which point someone on the crew yells out, huzzah, her sides are made of iron, leading to the later moniker, um, the old iron sides. The naval history that I found from the 1800s reads, Hull had been walking the quarter deck, keenly watching every movement. He was quite fat and wore very tight breeches. And as the two ships got closer together, Lieutenant Morris said, permission to fire, sir, and that was not granted. And they'd get closer after a few more minutes, permission to fire, uh, again, no. Half a pistol shot away, Hull calls out, 
Now, boys, pour it into them. And the naval history continues. <clears throat> when the smoke cleared, it was discovered that the commander in his energetic movements had split his tight breeches from waistband to knee, but he did not stop to change them during the action. The Constitution's first broadside took down the Guerrier's mizzenmast. The two ships at this point were practically touching. Um, the Marines were up in the rigging firing down. Um, the uh, later blast uh, took out the foremast and when the Guerrier's foremast went down, it took out the mainmast and um, one, one mast falling on to the other. So under a flag of truce, Lieutenant Morris rode over. Uh, Commander, uh, excuse me, Commodore Hall's compliments and wishes to know if you have struck your flag. Da Chris replied, well, I don't know. Our mizzenmast is gone. Our mainmast is gone. And, and upon the whole, you may say that we have struck our flag. The Guerriere was a wreck. Um, it was set on fire. The, the surviving members of the crew were captured and brought on board. Um, Dacrez came on board and offered up his sword as a token of surrender. And Hall is reported to have said, no, no, Captain, I'll not take a sword from one who knows so well how to use it, uh, but I will trouble you for that hat. And upon his death, as executors were cleaning up Dacrez's accounts, they found a notation that he had paid one beaver hat to Hull. This was a much needed victory occurring just a month or so into the war. The British had won victories near Detroit and American newspapers made a big splash of it. Hull got a hero's welcome uh, with celebrations and the key to the city in Boston, New York, Philadelphia, District of Columbia. He was awarded a gold medal by Congress. The crew was awarded $50,000 to divide among themselves. And we are left with a great story um, and um, wonderful contributions to our growing list of contradance DNA. Hull's victory. Next time you dance it, think of Isaac Hull and that epic battle at sea. A few more dances. that Ralph Page didn't call very much. It is in his country dance book, but it wasn't one of his. And um, Dudley had learned it when he was a student at the agricultural school in Stockbridge, Mass. One of his teachers who taught palmology um, was a caller and, and called Rory O'Moore. And that's where Dudley learned it. Um, as I've mentioned many times, American dances and our contras don't exist in a vacuum. We have close ties with other cultures and of course in this case with with Ireland. There are several historical Rory O'Moores, the one shown in this illustration shown in the forest with this hunting dog. Uh, he died fighting the English in 1578. His nephew, another Rory O'Moore, was a leader of the Irish rebellion against the English in 1641 and so Rory O'Moore was a storied character in um, in Irish history um, and I found this wonderful and silent film there's a link for it in your packet uh, Lindsay if you haven't uh, added a new version of the packet you might put it into the chat window um, it's a it's a silent film and I've added a little bit of a Rory O'Moore song just for a bit of a soundtrack. We're not going to play by by all means. We're not playing the whole thing. But here's here's our noble 
hero in the fight for Irish independence. The old audio more courted young Kathleen Vaughan. He was bold as a hog, she is soft as the dawn. He wished in his heart for the Kathleen to please. He thought the best way to do that was to tease. The Rory be easy, sweet Kathleen would cry. Be proof in our lips with a smile in our eye. Your tricks I don't know in truth what I'm about. Give tears till I put on me cloak inside out. And Rory goes off to fight for independence, but he has been observed by this scurvy character who is later in the movie turns, uh, spoiler alert, Rory gets turned into the English by that gentleman whom you just saw there. Rory O'Moore was a staple of the programs when I started dancing in the 70s. And in this clip, it's being danced in Indiana. It was brought there by Dylan Buston, who took traditional New England contras with him to Indiana. And he wanted to call, but the musicians there only played old time Southern Appalachian tunes. And um, so that's where that hodgepodge of New England dances with Southern Appalachian tunes develops initially in Bloomington and then elsewhere. So the tune here is John Brown's Dream. And those of you who watch closely will see that Dylan took with him from New Hampshire the left footed balance. Um, and so here's a little of Rory O'Moore being done in the mid 1970s in Indiana. And a tradition, if it's, if it's a living tradition, it's going to change. The music will change, the figures will change, the style of dancing will change. And that's certainly uh, been the case all along and is continuing to happen. So Rory O'Moore gives us quite a bit more in our Contra Dance DNA. And I have one last dance that I want to talk about. And those of you who know me uh, know that uh, we couldn't do a program like this without talking about Money Musk. Now, there are different spellings. The Scots prefer M-O-N-Y. Um, in, in English and uh, in the States, we do M-O-N-E-Y. In your packet, there's a link to a wonderful um, website. The late fiddler, Alan Jabor, uh, with his wife, did a pilgrimage to Money Musk. And my wife and I, in fact, did a pilgrimage to Money Musk when we were in, sh in Scotland in 2017. It's a beautiful, beautiful um, small town, uh, and uh, Money Musk is uh, honored Scottish country dance. The Scots dance it as a Strathspey, very elegant form of dance. <laughs> tune um, was published in 1776 by Daniel Dow uh, titled Sir Archibald Grant of Money Musk's Reel and dance instructions first started appearing in London in 1785 and again in 1786 um, scarce 10 years after the publication of the tune. The tune was one that many of us first encountered the name of it when we were kids reading The Little House in the Prairie, Little House in the Big Woods, all of those, Laura's pa played Money Musk. Um, the dance went through numerous changes. Um, in the Cracking Chestnut series that David and I wrote, um, most dances get several pages in the book. Money Musk gets lots more. There's a lot to say about this particular dance. It did start out as a 32 bar dance, um, a full full length contra dance. And here's a video of it being done in that older style. Right hand, you're 
But sometime in the late 1800s, dancers in northern um, New England, in Vermont and New Hampshire, shortened everything. They kept the figures, but they dropped eight bars of music so that you started doing the dance in 24 bars instead of 32. And that led to interesting timing. Here's a, an origami crane animation created by Ariel Barton. And uh, here's the way that it's most commonly done today uh, by humans, not cranes. All right, so David Smuckler and I really felt that Money Musk wasn't getting enough respect, and we started this Bring Back Money Musk movement. A friend of David's designed this T-shirt, um, and on David's um, Bring Back Money Musk page, you can find wonderful collection of videos and information about the, um, the first international Money Musk moment, and then the following year when we had uh, International Money Musk Month. And at this point, I think it's safe to say that there are enough newer dancers, younger dancers who have discovered the dance. Um, one of them is uh, Imogen Mills, a uh, uh, dancer and uh, organizer. And here she's singing Money Musk in Solfege. And it goes, it goes faster. So Money Musk, no partner swing, no neighbor swing, but certainly lots of young people have discovered uh, this particular dance. This is from the Youth Dance Weekend. <laughs> It's probably worth noting that that lively balancing that my generation and others adopted uh, was one of the reasons that Ralph Page stopped calling the dance. He didn't like it. Um, he thought Money Musk was a more elegant dance. It had forward and back and not that vigorous stomping and he just stopped calling the dance. One of the reasons when we do Money Musk uh, one of the reasons that we don't get to do Money Musk as much as some of us would like is that it's not an easy tune to play. Um, and when you have fiddlers who can play the tune, you really want to show your appreciation. Here's a short clip of um, three fiddlers playing, including David Kaner, who just last month received the Lifetime Contribution Award from CDSS.
can't wait to get back onto the dance floor. I'll play one more little Money Musk clip and then um, we'll uh, get into a more interactive mode. Um, Ralph Sweet. To be able to be in a room and hear music like that live and dance to it. It's coming. It's coming. I'd like to encourage people to buy the book if you don't already have a copy and information about that is in your packet and also to explore the, the Chestnuts website. Um, this is where you can reach me. That information is also in the packet. I love talking about this stuff with people. And I'm going to um, get out of sharing my screen and take a look at the chat and um, take some questions and comments. So stop share. There were some very lovely discussions in the chat, especially that last video that came up. I don't know about uh, anybody else, but I got all misty eyed seeing all those familiar faces. <laughs> Oh, Bev Burma, three primo fiddlers. Yes, that clip of yes. that clip of uh, Lissa and uh, David Kaner and uh, Becky Tracy is it's the very end of it. And it starts with David talking. And of course, David, those of you who don't know, David said ALS and at this point is unable to speak. Um, in fact, when he gave his um, thanks for the Lifetime Contribution Award. He had dictated the entire thing by um, one letter at a time from his eye. Um, and it was a long, it was like five minutes long. So seeing him playing those exquisite harmonies was really, really special. Yeah, can't wait to get back on the dance floor. So, uh, Lindsay, were there any questions in particular that came up or do we want to throw, I want to, oh my. 
um, looking back at some lots of, your... of enthusiasm, lots of enthusiasm, um, and and mostly not necessarily questions per se. And of course, if you have questions now, feel free to ask them. Unmute yourself. You're welcome to do that as well. Um, but or mostly, written. it was just comments. <laughs> Yep. Yeah, I, I see. And uh, the custom in, in D.C. was to kiss your neighbor on the balances. Yeah, we, we joked that Rory O'Moore was the favorite dance of the dentists, because as you balance together, you'd kiss your partner or your neighbor. And uh, and if you missed, by God. <laughs> so uh, I'm just looking back through here. Uh, Let's see what I got. Uh, Rory and more money must be yeah, money. I'm glad money must turns up often in the, the list of uh, ones. French Ford. Oh, nice. Chorus jig. Yeah. Chorus jig was the dance late at night. Everyone would just know how to do it. And and the bands would play it. And it was sort of by default. Um, so Sharon, uh, sorry, Sue Dupree just asked, uh, what do you see as the future for these chess sets? Well, that's the question. That's the question that I'm, I'm. I'm hoping that people here will will think about. I mean, um, one of the things. I mean, for all my disclaimers, one of the things that most of the chestnuts have is a a tune that generally is associated with it. And when I was thinking about contemporary dances, I only could come up with two, where there is a tune, and a dance was written to go to that specific tune. Uh, I'll see if any. Um... And then there's a question about the story that you promised. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so the two, the two that I can think of, one is uh, Cherokee Shuffle, which is a tune that has um, a couple extra bars in it. It can be played squared off, but David Kaner wrote a dance that fit Cherokee Shuffle just that way. And Wizard's Walk, yep, Janine and Phyllis just chimed in. That's that's the other. And Wizard's Walk is one of those odd dances because many musicians have told me that they don't want to learn, they don't want to learn Wizard's Walk because it would only get used for that dance. And they wanted to spend their time learning tunes that would get used that had more general applicability and sort of like Money Musk, you can't play a generic tune and dance Money Musk. Um, so um, are there other, are there other, sorry, that is no neighbor swings, just part. <laughs> uh, Real Beatrice, yes, um, and there, yep, thank you, Judy. And there's another version uh, to, that goes to Real Beatrice, um, another dance written by a caller, I think in New York. Um, so there, there aren't many. Are there dances that you can think of? I mean, all of these dances at one time were new um, or relatively new. What are the dances that are, are going to last? I mean, are there dances, Shadrach's Delight, for instance, that we think of as a classic of the modern dances, Tony Parks' wonderful, wonderful dance. Is that a dance that will become in 30 or 40 years? Will that be, you know, a, a contra chestnut? Will people say, oh yeah, I remember when we're, well, I won't be around in 30 or 40 years, but younger dancers. Um, seems like the kids today, oh, Donnie, seems like the kids today don't appear for <laughs> to slow and not complicated. Yeah, well, you know, we- Hey, I resemble that comment, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I, I get upset about watching certain things on the dance floor, the swing dance and the, the blues, the blues moves that come in. And then I, I've got to say, I was part of that generation that took um, Ladies Chain, when we still called it Ladies Chain, and did, used to be a courtesy turn. And we discovered, oh, you could twirl the lady under. Oh, she could go twice. You could do three times. Could you do four <clears throat> and still get there in time? Um, so, you know, we were the ones who put that stomp balance into Money Musk. So we we change things and the younger dancers today are certainly changing them um, more. And as I mentioned in one of my other talks, the question in my mind is how far can you change something 
and still have it be traditional um you know at what point if you're dancing to if you're doing techno contra and everything you're dancing to is uh pop music that's been um squared off to fit contra styling is that is that contra dance um and i i won't be around long enough to see what happens with with that um ooh fit mother's reel scout house reel possibly wonderful wonderful ted sanella wonderful ted sanella dance um i don't know how many of these i mean i loved looking back at elizabeth birchinall and even ralph page and seeing the changes that had occurred over the last 50 75 years um, that the dances that we think of like chorus jig reading that chorus jig had fallen out of favor by 1917 and clearly it made a resurgence um, that that one from the Birchinall, the circle. I, I don't know that we're going to see a resurgence of the circle, but maybe someone will dig it up. I mean, lamplighters, Dudley found lamplighters in the Ricky Holden book. And that's when he started calling it um, and brought it, brought it more fervently into the repertoire. Excuse me, it was in Ralph's book too. Um, so it's possible... Um, McQuillan's favorite, Bob McQuillan's favorite of the Chestnuts was Morning Star, which was one of the six dances shown on that list from Nelson of the required dances that they wanted everyone to have. Morning Star is active couple, balance, and swing, a right hand balance and swing, and then active couple, left hand balance and swing, but swing in the other direction. It's a reverse swing. It's a great um, equalizer on the dance floor because beginning dancers and experienced dancers alike have, uh, the experienced have more trouble with it because they're, we're so used to going um, in a clockwise direction. Um, and so it usually leads to a great deal of hilarity. McQuillan told the story of dancing that once. Um, there were only, he and another guy were the only two people left in the dance hall. And McQuillan asked this guy, you want to dance? And the guy said, well, I will, but I'm not going to be the goddamn lady. And McQuillan said, well, I'll be the goddamn lady. And they danced um, Morning Star. And in that reverse swing, someone lost a grip and someone went flying over, hit the stove pipe of the stove in the room, wood stove, knocked it loose. So smoke is billowing out in the room. McQuillan thought that was a great, a great, a great moment. Um, a nice combination. Oh, a lovely lovely smooth dance thanks Lindsay, for putting the packet in um a lot of them uh use english figure. yeah english figures have really um we've seen a growing anglicization of contra dancing and given that contra is originally split off from english country dancing i mean hayes um, the, what, what had been known as gypsies, all those flowing movements that come from English country dance and many more are working their way into, into contra dance, contemporary contra dance choreography. Um, and we're, we're seeing a mix and also contra dance figures working their way into English choreography. Um, so the interchange among the various styles is certainly is certainly happening um, a, a lot more. Um, da, 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 da. Butter. Um, Bev bench mentions butter. Uh, Chris Page, who keeps close track of all things Contra, told me recently that if you go looking for Contra dances on YouTube, Butter by Gene Hubert is there more than any other Contra dance. I think it's something like 200 different clips of, of butter can be found. And um, I remember I was at an event and um, we were a bunch of callers sharing notes for what we were going to call. And several of them had butter written down on their list. And I had never heard of it. Um, I said, butter, what's that? And they looked at me like, what's, you know, Rip Van Winkle, uh, where, where did you come from? And it's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful, smooth um, Gene, Gene Hubert dance. Um, so someone asked <coughs> for the uh, Lady Walpoles, um, and this is a short one, so I have to go back into presentation mode um, if I can figure out how to do that. So give me just a sec, and um, I'll do that, and then, and then I'll come back. Um, 
So portion of screen or set there, share, go back into play. Da da da. All right, so <clears throat> I need to warn you, there's a strong fake lore alert here. Um, and part of the fun of digging around in old dances is just seeing what turns up. And then, of course, the challenge is, can you verify it? And in this case, the stories are just so too good to ignore. So it's an example of how much fun. Um, so take 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 this with caution, all right? So Sir Robert Walpole was England's first prime minister. This part is all fact. Everything here is fact. The fake lore is whether this is the Lady Walpole. He was England's first prime minister, uh, 1730s, 1740s. He served for more than 20 years, and which is still a record in England. Uh, his opponents called him the screen master general because from behind his screen, he would pull the strings and um, uh, shield his allies from scandal and, and work his, his, devious, his devious deeds. Uh, Lady Walpole, uh, Catherine Shorter, um, married him. Sir Robert um, was known for cultivating, uh, Britannica says, a frank, hearty manner and a political subtlety that has scarcely been equaled. And one measure of just how popular he was and how respected is that King George II summoned him and said, uh, Sir Robert, I'd like to, pres I can't do a, a George II accent, um, said, I'd like to present you with a house. It's a gift from the crown. Um, and it's, it's for you and your family. It's at number 10 Downing Street. And Sir Robert refused the gift. He said, I cannot accept this gift for myself, but I will accept it on behalf of all the future prime ministers of England. His career ended in 1742. He had a couple rocky years toward the end. And two years after he ceased being um, prime minister was the first publication of a book of nursery rhymes that contained Who Killed Cock Robin, which was widely considered to be a reference to Sir Robert Walpole and the end of his career. Meanwhile, Lady Walpole was renowned for her extravagant lifestyle. She frequently went to, she frequently went to the opera. She bought expensive clothes and jewelry, and the two of them, the couple, became estranged uh, during his prime ministership. And he had a succession of mistresses living with them in several of his halls while she was still alive. She, on the other hand, <laughs> apparently did not lead a chaste life either. Um, and it was reported that when their youngest son, Horace, was born 10 years after his siblings and at a time when the marriage was definitely cool, uh, young Horace did not share looks or character with any siblings or his father. Um, so thinking that Lady Walpole and Sir Robert, that this Lady Walpole is the Lady Walpole of our dance is such an enticing prospect. I mean, however, you need to be careful. This is a couple in the 1730s or 1740s. Granted, we have Ralph saying the dance was known later as Lady Washington's Reel. So that's Revolutionary War era, 30 or 40 years later. But for that dance to have existed before, there should be some record of it. There is no record of a dance um, called Lady Walpole's Reel or a dance with those figures in the English country dance repertoire. Would colonists in the States 30, 40 years after the fact, 
write a dance based on this these figures from earlier in English dance history. The dance was published in 1842 in the US. That's 100 years later. So it's enticing to think that there may be a connection. But um, I, I think you want to um, reserve, uh, uh, sus suspend disbelief just just a little bit. So that's what I dug up about Lady Walpole, and I'm gonna I'm gonna keep looking and stop sharing and get out of this mood. So, uh, well, David, we probably have time for one more question before great. we and, sign off. Yep, and I've got to get supper. <laughs> Three thirty-three. Oh yeah. Don't let the truth get in the way. was the ladies Walpole reel because Walpole is right nearby and all the ladies of Walpole did it. That's what we were told. Aha, uh -huh, aha. Uh -huh. Well, and Newt, Newt calls it ladies Walpole reel, uh, not lady Walpoles. Um, now, you know, there's a Walpole, New Hampshire. Walpole, New Hampshire was, um, had, had a dancing master from the late 1700s visit there. Who knows? Um, I need to save the file because I want to read the chat comments. Uh, save chat. Yeah. Um, thank you, thank you all for for turning out um, this afternoon or evening, whatever it is. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, uh, Folk Mads. Thank you, New Mexico Arts. It's just great. And my wife and I have been. We've had our two shots, and I've actually booked a wedding dance, an outdoor wedding dance for late June. I think it's. We're getting there. We're getting there. So keep masking. Um, Bev, I've been in touch with Jan in Czech Republic. We don't know, but it's getting better there. So we'll see. Thanks very much, everyone. And I look so much forward to seeing you. I'll be in New Mexico, I guess, next Memorial Day, assuming we get through this. Um, mm -hmm. And can't wait to share stories in person and meet many of you in person. Thanks very much for Absolutely. the evening. Thank you, David, so much. We so appreciate you. And um, for everyone else, feel free to check the Folk Mads website, folkmads.org. We've got an online concert coming up with the Adobe Brothers and then a clogging workshop with a date TBD. TBD and we're also hosting an evening of waltzes later this month um, as well. So uh, keep in touch. And I will be emailing out the packet and the link to the video if you want to share it with anybody uh in your email so keep an eye out for that it, it's been an absolute pleasure thank you so much for joining us thank you david for both of your talks uh thank this you so wonderful and thank you of course to new mexico arts for sponsoring all of our online programming this year so i hope to see everyone on the dance floor very 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 soon all right have a good night